It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Dan Nocera. Uh, he is the uh, Patterson Rockwood Professor of Energy at Harvard University. Uh, he is the inventor of the artificial leaf and the bionic leaf, which uh, he will talk about next. Uh, and uh, this work, I think, started at MIT, uh, and uh, it, it broke the world record in the efficiency of uh, solar to fuel conversion, uh, I think, by a factor of 10 compared to uh, natural photosynthesis. So this is really a, a torty force. And uh, it, it won the uh, breakthrough uh, technology uh, in uh, 2017 by the World Economic Forum. And uh, he, uh, this also uh, is uh, applied to uh, nitrogen fixing. So it's not only uh, for, for fuel, but it's really for uh, land uh, recommendation and uh, recovery. And uh, Dan is, uh, is the most uh, prolific uh, chemist. He has worked on uh, actually a lot of uh, inventions and, and scientific, fundamental scientific research uh, covering uh, proton-coupled uh, electron transfer. Where is Dan? Okay, uh, and uh, uh, also uh, on uh, uh, chemo sensors uh, uh, for uh, tumor uh, profiling, he w he produced the uh, first uh, quantum spin liquid, uh, and uh, he uh, also even worked on a molecular tagging uh, technique for understanding uh, turbulent flow. So uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce him uh, on a sustainable and renewable cycle for food and fuels from just sunlight, air, and water. Yeah. So um, thank you for inviting me. And today I'll talk about this issue of just using sunlight, air, and water as your energy system. That's it. Uh, but before doing that, I just want to frame the problem uh, in this way. When you talk about energy, you really have to have two personalities. So I think a lot of this conference will be on the left side, which is the legacy, the developed world. You put tens of trillions of dollars into your energy infrastructure and you paid it off. And because of that, you have a different challenge than in the developing world where they haven't really started in investing yet. So they have greater flexibility in adopting new energy systems than you do in the developed world. So that's why you've got to break your head up into two pieces. On the left side, it's usually centralized. The opportunity exists on the right side to be decentralized. Now, for the centralized world and the developed world, I'm not going to talk about this, but uh, we, you, you have to, and I think I put this on the last slide, you have to adapt to the existing infrastructure if you're going to make an impact. Because you've paid it off, you're not going to just show up with some new discovery and displace tens of trillions of paid off infrastructure. So you have to adapt to the current infrastructure. And we did that while I was here at MIT. I started a company called Sun Catalytics. You can look, in 2012, we made that little flow battery. I never published a paper on this, by the way. When it works, you don't publish papers in science or nature. So uh, <clears throat> we made that little flow battery. And then in 2014, it was acquired by Lockheed Martin. And this year, they're rolling out a flow battery that will be around 10 megawatts, and by 2020, 100 megawatts. So with 100 megawatt storage on the floor of a power company, it really will change renewables, because the power company will, you don't need any capital, or you don't need any government incentives. The power company will put the solar panel on your roof, because they know their market for 100 megawatts, and they'll know what their buyback should be to pay it off. Um, Ju mentioned I could talk about that, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about the right side of the ice cream cone, the developing world. Now, the reason for that is a few years ago I did calculations, and you can easily calculate energy use in the world. And it, this goes to the last talk that you just heard. Uh, you're going to need a lot of energy, and if you conserve every bit you need today, you still need a lot of energy. And you can ask why. And that's because of this 
developing world issue, there's 1.4 billion people with no electricity and wires. There's 1.6 of low energy use, so there's 3 billion low energy users. And the 3 billion being born into the world by the mid-century, they're being born in that part of the world, not this part of the world. So if you really want to attack things like climate change, my argument is you need to spend all your time worrying about that part of the world. There's enough people worrying about this part of the world. All right, so that's my contention. And like I said, it's a different mindset. You have to think differently about your science and your engineering and your discovery. And I just want to mention that we do things, and for instance, you heard last talk, we should move to methane, because it's going to help the developed world a lot. But I like these, I like, I'm a chemist, so I like simple equations, and I can get right to it by showing you, if you just use water and you put CO2 per energy equivalent of hydrogen, I can explain a lot of data and a lot of trends in the world with just these three equations. So what you see is because there's four hydrogens on carbon when you combine it with water, you get four H2s per CO2. If you use coal, you get two H2s per CO2. Gasoline has, a, on average, two hydrogens per carbon. You get three. With those, I can explain um, those three equations and knowing the, the carbon mix of any country, which you can look on Google, I can explain their entire, you can predict and explain, calculate almost verbatim their CO2. Because of this equation, so while methane might be good for us in the developed world, I just told you we're going to have six billion people. You better not have any carbon in it if you really are worried about greenhouse gases. So that argument says I should spend all my time worrying about the developed world. To, again, put you on track about what I'm going to say, there's absolutely nothing I'm going to say today that you can't do. If you wanted to, you could put solar panels everywhere, you could use electrolyzers, you could split water, you could make hydrogen, you can do water gas shift reaction, you can take the hydrogen with CO and syn fuels and do fissure tropes and make gasoline. Totally renewable if you want it. You can take ammonia and not use methane as your hydrogen source and make fertilizer, which is a big CO2 emitter. You could take hydrogen from solar water splitting. You would be totally renewable. So there's not one thing I'm going to tell you today you can't do in a large centralized infrastructure. You don't do it because it's going to be more expensive, so you don't want to do it. But you could if you were really, really scared. That's why I don't think you're really that scared yet. Okay? Um, but what you can't do is everything I just told you that Shell can do in large centralized infrastructures, you can't do it in your backyard. And if you're going to go to the poor, you they haven't made a huge investment in an infrastructure. All your science and engineering, you should think, how can I do it in somebody's backyard? Does it have to be one backyard? No. It could be a village. It could be one house in a village. But that's how you should think I would contend for the developing world. So that's what I want to talk about today. So it's distributed. It should be as low capex as possible, low capital expenditure. So you've got to have good science discoveries. And this is important, instead of be available to all. So now I'll get you why I like sunlight, air, and water. If you're the poorest person in the world or you live in Hollywood, in Beverly Hills, and you look up, you can all see sun. So that's why I like solar, not for all the other reasons. It's the only energy source everybody can have access to. There's air around you. And there's water. Now, what you're going to say is, no, you need really clean water to do energy. So in our research, we said, we'll use dirty water. We'll use the Charles River. We'll use a puddle off the ground. We'll use urine as our hydrogen source. So we have to invent things that work out of dirty water. So with this idea, we set out to do this, and then you can say, wow, that sounds hard, sunlight, air, and water. But I just want to remind you, all those little green things out there are doing it as I'm speaking. It's, they're taking sunlight, air, and water, and they're powering the planet. All right? That's, you live with it every day. You just walk by them. 
By the way, they're nicer than people. They don't talk back to you when they're beautiful, so you should spend more time talking to them. Now, here's the thing about photosynthesis, though, which my community forgets. The sun is only used to split water to hydrogen and oxygen. So when the sun's hitting those leaves right now, they're not making carbohydrate. They don't need the sun to make carbohydrate or sugar. So from grade school, CO2 plus sunlight plus water gives oxygen and carbohydrate. It's only using the sun to split water. In the dark, it takes the hydrogen and combines it with carbon dioxide to make biomass. So we said we're going to do the same thing. We're not going to try to put CO2 in water to go to fuel directly. And I'll show you why that's really hard to do and why nature decided to separate things. And I'll also show thermodynamically why nature did this. We kind of forget what nature really does. So we set out to do exactly the same thing, use sunlight to split water, hydrogen and oxygen. Once we figure that out, and I did that here at MIT. Then we'll go and figure out how to take the hydrogen and the carbon dioxide in the dark and make stuff out of it. All right, so that's what we said. So first, let me tell you about photosynthesis. It's a long studied field. I'm, I'm going to talk about it as a systems engineer, not as a biologist. So what did, sun, what did photosynthesis do? Sunlight, you can't get your hands around a photon really hard in case you have tried. It's kind of hard to grab a photon. Leaf knew it too. So what it did is it did what we do technologically. As soon as the sunlight hits the leaf, it sends a positive charge in one direction in the membrane and a negative charge in the other. Moving charge is current, so leaves are buzzing with electricity, just no wires. It then stores the current or the electrons and holes, one equivalent at a time in a cofactor, and it ramps up the redox potential of the metal centers. That's what Professor Woodall was talking about. The plant knew that that isn't enough energy density to be a battery. At that point, it's a battery. It's taking charge and storing it at metal centers. That's what a battery does. It then said, not enough energy density, so I'm going to take that stored charge and then make a chemical reaction occur and make a fuel. And the fuel is hydrogen and oxygen from water. So we said well, we're going to try to do the same thing. We'll take some material, have light hit it, get wireless moving charge. We're going to do it one unit at a time. To split water, you need four units of charge, four holes, four electrons, and then we'll cover that material with catalysts as it gets stored up like a battery charge and then act on water and split it to hydrogen and oxygen. So we said we'll try to do that. <clears throat> it was mentioned in the intro, I actually spent 20 years of my life here at MIT not doing any of that because I had to figure out how protons talk to electrons. That's a hard thing, because electrons, remember from your quantum mechanics, they're diffuse, they're wave-like. Protons are more, I would say, Newtonian. They also tunnel. But because their mass is 2,000 times out of an electron, they get decoupled. So for 20 years at MIT, we spent our time timing protons and electrons, and then we put together the first theories of what's called proton coupled electron transfer. And the reason you want to do that, say I take just protons to hydrogen, we say that runs at zero volts versus NHE. And it is a zero volt reaction when the protons are coupled to the electrons. If they aren't, if I add an electron to a proton, I make H dot, you go 2.3 volts uphill. Then the next electron proton, you go 2.3 volts downhill. So to run a zero volt reaction, you're going to have to waste 2.3 volts if you can't have protons talking to electrons. On the O2 side, you go 3.4 volts uphill, and then you come 2.2 volts downhill on the oxygen side. So that's why we spent so much time developing the theory of proton coupled ET, because you can't split water efficiently and not waste energy if you don't know how to have electrons and protons talk to each other. 
And then all these students from all that theory made this catalyst. I'm just not going to go into it in too much detail. But you oxidize cobalt 2 plus to 3 plus. Matt Cannon did this right across the street in buildings 6 and 2. You oxidize cobalt 2 to 3 in the presence of phosphate. And you make a thin film on an electrode. So I'm no sun yet. I'm just trying to split water and get those O2 and H2 reactions to work. And so if you plug the electrode into the wall, you'll see a thin film form. You just have cobalt in solution. It's a colorless solution. And then you see this thin film form. And as thin film forms, you start seeing lots of oxygen at a low over potential, 150 millivolts over the O2 couple. So we, have, we run it at around 1.4 volts. <clears throat> that film is actually molecules. It's not a solid state material. All right. It's the picture I show you there. Um, I won't go into any of this, but the one thing I want to mention is this is now getting to the using only sunlight, air, and water. I need to split water to O2 and hydrogen, but regular waters. There was no catalyst that was known to do that, and that's due to building one over here, corrosion. This is the one of the old, old problems. Actually, MIT in the early 1900s led the field in understanding corrosion, and this is lots of years of work. If you split water to H2, H2 and O2, when you first split the water to O2, you leave four protons behind. In water, protons can't attach to H2O because you make a strong acid, H3O+. Plus. So what happens? The protons go to the oxygens in the oxide lattice, and you dissolve them out, and the catalyst corrodes. So that's why if you look at any electrolyzer, people run in concentrated base, because as soon as they make protons, the base is there to sop them up and protect their catalyst. That's how you avoid corrosion. But I can't do that. I can't ship a bunch of concentrated base all over the world to poor people. And there's whole liability issues. I literally just want to use a puddle on the ground. So what we said is we'll make a catalyst that self-assembles. And I already told you we had that. Cobalt 2 goes to cobalt 3 in the presence of phosphate. It self-assembles. But that self-assembly process, the energetics for that thermodynamically will be less than the energetics for water splitting. So as long as I have enough potential to split water to O2, then I should have enough energy to drive the self-assembly process. And Yogi, who's now an assistant professor here at MIT, and Kwabana, who just went to Berkeley as an assistant professor, they figure that out. So just look at the rate law above. And the rate law above, that's the rate for making O2 depending on the proton concentration and potential. Eta is the potential over potential, delta E. Then this poor guy spent four years of his life to give me one slide. That's actually the mechanism for, for self-assembly. It's just not taking cobalt 2 to 3 plus and then forming on the electrode. It's much more complicated. And that's the rate law. Once you have those two rate laws, look at the red line. It's inverse third order in proton. The blue line, which is, that's the self-assembly process. It depends on inverse third order in proton. The water splitting depends on first order inverse proton. So the red line steeper than the blue. Anywhere in that green region, so look at pH 7. At pH 7, I split water to make oxygen. We're only doing, by the way, all this work for one half reaction. To just make O2 at 1.2 volts, I have 300 millivolt over potential to drive that complicated self-assembly process. This catalyst never dies if you're in that green region, and that green region subsumes all water sources. I don't have to be in concentrated base or acid. And it works. So it works. We've run it out of the Charles River. We just walked over to the boathouse and took some water out of there. We've taken puddles off the ground. I wish I could say we did it out of the Boston Harbor. Yogi was a grad student. This is, if you're grad students out here, what drives research faculty insane. I said, Yogi, go see if it works out of seawater. 
And I walked in the lab a few days later and Aldrich had sent me a 55 gallon drum of seawater that Yogi bought, he bought his seawater. So I said, Yogi, you're gonna do the urine experiments and it works out of urine too. Now that's good because that means that you're carrying your water source if you need it, all right? As a side light here, if I can split water, urine to O2 and H2, when I recombine it, you get clean drinking water. We haven't even had time to pursue that yet. So the, it's not, by the way, I wouldn't say that's how you should purify water. That might be too expensive, but as a side bonus, there's a way to get clean drinking water. The other nice thing is if you're in pH 7 water, is I can integrate with materials easily, like silicon. Silicon doesn't like concentrated base. And I can inter interface with biology. Trees grow at pH 7 water. They don't grow in concentrated base or acid. One of my friends at Caltech has trouble understanding that. He thinks the whole world should be in concentrated base or acid. So that whole self-healing issue, which we spent a lot of time understanding and getting to work, opened up all these other possibilities. So first, let's do the full system. I did that here, and we called it the artificial leaf. And the reason why we called it the artificial leaf is we got the solar part of photosynthesis, using the sun to split water to oxygen and hydrogen. And what we made are three flavors of silicon. Amorphous silicon has a strained lattice, so it absorbs at 400 nanometers. And then, to reduce the strain, we dope germanium into it. Germanium's bigger than silicon. It relaxes the bond, so the band gap shrinks. And we kept doping germanium into it in the middle layer until we got to that 600 nanometer absorption band. And then we doped even more germanium into it. And then you get all the way out to the 900. So that triple junction is the top, is the absorption spectrum of top, middle, and bottom layers. And that perfectly matches the solar absorption spectrum. So I catch every bit of light. And now sunlight hits that junction and you separate charge, just like it happens in the leaf. One unit at a time, no wires. Positive charge goes up, negative charge goes down. I do it four times, and then my cobalt catalyst splits water to O2, the way I showed you. It's stable in a, in a regular water source. And then we made this nickel molybdenum zinc alloy that I won't go into, but it works nicely. We used the chem engineering trick of de-alloying. So we take the zinc, electrolyze it out, we get spongy nickel molybdenum catalyst that makes hydrogen. And this thing works. I'm not gonna, who cares, it's just bubbles. But you just put this in water, you hold it, it can run at 30 milliamps per centimeter squared, the solar flux. You just put it in this window and take any water source and you'll see oxygen and hydrogen coming off, all right? So that's the, le that's the left side. We have the solar part. How are we gonna do the right side, the fuel part? So the first thing to realize, which people forget, and I'm gonna emphasize this now, the sugar or biomass isn't for energy storage, it's hydrogen storage. The leaf combines hydrogen with CO2 to make things like fuel or carbohydrate because it couldn't store gaseous hydrogen. There's no energy content in that reaction. And I can prove it. There's the thermodynamic potential for splitting water. It's 1.23 volts uphill, delta G equals minus NF delta E. So uphill reaction, 1.23 volts, and I kept my hydrogen separated, four protons and four electrons, so I could take three moles of hydrogen, combine it with CO2, and make methanol at pH 7. That's 170 millivolts downhill. Or I could make methane downhill or thermoneutral, or ice, that's isopropanol, isopentanol, isobutanol. I'll show you why we made those in a minute. All downhill reactions. By the way, any fuel, gasoline, downhill. All right, so that's why the leaf separated the proton part making O2 and hydrogen 
from the fuel part because it doesn't need energy once it has the hydrogen. And it does it in the dark. And if you're a photosynthetic chemist, it's been known for 40 years. It's called the Calvin-Benson cycle, more than 40 years, 60 years, which Calvin got the Nobel Prize for. And it's called the dark cycle of photosynthesis. Okay, so great. So I don't need sun. There's other reasons the leaf separates water making H2 from CO2 reduction, and that's because of this problem. If you're an electron and you are trying to reduce CO2, that's hard to do. It's kinetically hard, double bonds. If there's protons around, it's easier to reduce them and make hydrogen. So if you're trying to reduce CO2 out of water, all your current will go into hydrogen production. It's not going to touch CO2. So that's why you shouldn't be trying to reduce CO2 out of water. If you look in science and nature this week, there'll be somebody trying to reduce CO2, and they'll spend all their time talking about how they didn't make lots of hydrogen. That's what made them selective for CO2. The other reason is I showed you six, five products within 180 millivolts of each other. I could have put over 200 products within 180 millivolts of each other. As a matter of fact, if you do syngas and fissure tropes, it's mostly a chem engineering problem separating things for that reason. And then finally, the two reactions on the left side are just hydrogenating carbon, C1, but fuels have carbon-carbon bonds. And so that told us, because now I have self-healing catalysts that can work in water, I can introduce integrate my water splitting to biology. So that whole photosynthetic membrane starting on the far left, it's photosystem two. That's the huge pro enzyme complex that makes O2. It leaves four protons behind, passes it all the way over to the right. Remember I told you electrons head in one direction and holes the other. The electrons come all the way down that massive membrane to photosystem one, and I have it circled above, you make NADPH. Once you have NADPH, I can make ATP. Once I have ATP, I have cellular energy. So I can now replace a massive part of the photosynthetic membrane with my artificial leaf. And now my challenge is, so that I'm now schematically showing those two blue balls, I'll replace those two blue balls with my artificial leaf. But I have a problem, and the problem is I'm making hydrogen. And the bugs are just looking at hydrogen. So how am I going to make some biological organism eat the hydrogen? So there's an enzyme, and it's called hydrogenase. And what hydrogenase does is it takes one molecule of H, two molecules of H2 to two protons, two electrons. One molecule of H2 to two protons, two electrons. That's what an enzyme hydrogenase does. So actually, work here at MIT, pioneered by Tony Sinsky, basically led us down this path in biology. We took Ralstonia eutropha. That's a biological organism. And then we overexpress genetically using synthetic biology. We put a gene sequence into the bug and said, just eat hydrogen. This poor Ralstonia eutropha can't eat any other food source. If, I, if it doesn't have hydrogen, it's dead. It can only eat hydrogen. We messed it up that way using synthetic biology. So it eats the hydrogen through these hydrogenases, because we've overexpressed them into the membrane. And now, out the other side of the hydrogenase comes the two protons and two electrons. We back end it to what's called a NADPH reductase. We back that end that to ATPase. And once you have ATP, I have energy, so I've taken solar water splitting with this trick and converted it into cellular energy, ATP. Once I have ATP in the dark, I can run cellular biosynthetic pathways. And so first off, you could just let the bacteria grow wildly. Do nothing to them. Just have them eat hydrogen. Two bacteria go to four, four go to eight. I grow biomass. But at that branch point, which is called acetylcoenzyme A, you can put other genes in there. So we put, like in this one, you put four genes in there. 
those four genes in red, ACT, FADC, ADH, those genes put different enzymes in the bug. So the FA puts a ketothiolase, the CTF puts this enzyme acetyltransferase, and acetoacetoacetonate decarboxylase, and then the last one is alcohol dehydrogenase. And the reason we put those in is organic chemistry. I have to break the carbon bond of acetyl coenzyme A. That's what a ketothiolase does. It makes a carbon-carbon bond. Then I have to hydrolyze it. That's what this CTF enzyme does. And then I decarboxylate it, and I then hydrogenate it. So these bugs excrete isopropanol, not ethanol, C3 alcohol. So that's what we do. We put solar panels on them. I put my biocompatible compatible catalyst in the water. As it's making hydrogen, the bug eats the hydrogen. It breeds carbon dioxide from the air, and it poops out isopropanol. That's literally what happens. Um, so that's how we do it, actually. We only throw a pinch of bugs in the water. You can't even see them. And then for two days, we let them eat hydrogen. They grow in concentration. That's called optical density. That's how biologists measure concentration, light scattering to number of bugs in the uh, water. So we do, you get them up to an OD of around one in this experiment. And then after that, we adjust the hydrogen levels to the hydrogenases and say, take all the other leftover H2, don't grow anymore. We could let them keep growing exponentially. But then we say, don't grow exponentially, take all the hydrogen left over, combine it with CO2, and make liquid fuel. And here is the bars. So the green bar is if I let the biomass grow exponentially using solar water splitting, I'm hitting, I'm hitting energy in. I can weigh the biomass. I know what the energy content of the biomass. We hit 10.7%. So I'm... Um, 10 times better than natural photosynthesis. So all the engineers out there who do biomass modeling, with this method, put a factor of 10 in front of all your models with biomass in terms of energy efficiency. This is the way to grow biomass, not plants in the ground. Plants in the ground you should eat. But you want, you want to grow biomass 10 times better than photosynthesis. We haven't done anything. Any chem engineers who want to work with me to take all this and go to biofuels, please come see me. I, I, I'm getting old. I don't have enough time anymore. OK, the, the red bar is isopropanol. That's 7%. The problem with isopropanol is it's water immiscible. So now I'm making a liquid fuel. I don't even need chem engineers. We went to the blue bar, that's isopentanol, C5 alcohol, because that just phase segregates from water. So I don't even need a chem engineer to do that for me. I just pour off the isopentanol. And that's five times the solar efficiency. And then that purple bar, magenta bar, keep in mind, that's polyhydroxybutyrate. So what did we do there? Not for this problem, it's for a problem just about to come. We're going to tell the bug, breathe in CO2. Remember, it's getting its CO2 from, I'm not going to get there. My red thing isn't working. Oh, there it is. It's breathing CO2 in from the air. I don't have to do concentration. It has carbonic anhydrases, just like those guys out there. They're, they're absorbing the CO2. But I have biomass that's absorbing carbon dioxide 10 times faster than those guys. So there's a sequestration mechanism thing coming in here in a few minutes. So I'm going to have them eat CO2 and make a plastic, and the fuel I'm going to keep inside the cell. Once I've done that, I've made the bug fat on solar energy, because I did water splitting, combined it with CO2, made a fuel. But I say, don't excrete it. Keep it inside yourself so you have a fuel and hydrogen source for the future. I'll show you where that's important. So we don't have to do CO2 concentration. This is better than an algae reactor. Algae reactors, you need to make sure every algae sees sunlight or you lose energy efficiency. Here, my solar panel, my artificial leaf, running at high energy efficiency. Remember, I absorbed the whole spectrum. That's why I'm getting these high photosynthetic yields. That is what is absorbing the light. And then the hydrogen goes to a vat in the dark. So I don't have this problem of having every reactant needing to see sunlight. So my reactor design is less costly. 
and I'm not competing with food. It's bugs in a vat, right? I'm not, I'm not taking food resources. What else is in the air? Nitrogen, and we heard about that last talk, actually, there were numbers up there for ammonia production using hydrogen and CO2 emission. And you get CO2 emission because we use methane in the developed world. So now you're in the backyard. Before I go on, I promised you sunlight, air, and water are making you fuels. Okay, yay. Is it going to be worth it to you guys? It should be. Is it cost competitive? No. No, no. And every time you, I see somebody say, oh, I'm going to be cheaper, uh, go, become a realist. If you can poke holes in the ground and just suck it out, you will never, ever, 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 ever be cheaper because you spent $17 trillion of money and you paid it off. So don't delude yourself. You're going to need carbon pricing to make this work, okay? But if you do that, there's something ready to go for you. But this one is already marketable because methane in especially countries like China they have to ship their methane in when they make fertilizer and you're making lots of CO2 when you take N2 plus hydrogen from methane to make ammonia and so what we did is we said the same trick now but we're going to run take a bug this is a different bug it's called a xanthobacteria and we run two parallel pathways one pathway, I do what we just did. I say, breed CO2, take hydrogen from solar water splitting, and make a fuel, but the fuel's polyhydroxybutyrate, the bioplastic. And I say, stay inside the cell. Then we do another pathway where we say, take the hydrogen from the polyhydroxybutyrate. I just told you, biomass is only hydrogen storage. So decompose the polyhydroxybutyrate, leave carbon behind, it leaves carbon behind, because after it dehydrogenates the PHB, you have carbon. And then take the hydrogen, breathe in nitrogen now, and feed it to an enzyme called nitrogenase and fix nitrogen to ammonia. So there's the bug on the right, that big white blob is I made the bacteria fat on polyhydroxybutyrate. So now they have a big internal solar supply that came from solar water splitting. So I've just made the bugs renewably fat on a food source from CO2 in the air. Now it doesn't need to see the sun anymore, right? Because I pre-stored it with sunlight in the form of PHB. It doesn't need to see CO2. It doesn't need hydrogen. It's hydrogens in the PHB. So in the dark, it can start eating, oops, those are the genes. It can start eating the PHB, take the hydrogen from the PHB, breathe the nitrogen in from the air in the dark, and make fertilizer or ammonia. And that works. So that red line in the middle is the bugs growing. What is it? What are they doing? Oh, yeah, I know. The blue line, the bugs are growing. I'm so far away, I can't see what the hell I have there. The red line, the bugs are growing, sorry. And that's the solid biomass. So it's bringing in nitrogen. It's using the hydrogen, and it's fixing it as biomass. The way it makes biomass is from ammonia. It's called the go-cat cycle, biosynthetically. We can put a small molecule block, you see that PPT? To prove that it's nitrogen from the air, we use N15 nitrogen. We put the small molecule block. We, the nitrogen doesn't get translated into solid biomass, the red rising line in the middle. It stops growing, and all of a sudden, the things start excreting ammonia. All right? And that's fertilizer. And I can assay it because I can say for every, every two ammonias, I make one hydrogen. So I can take acetylene plus hydrogen and make ethylene. And that red bar is ethylene. And I can see the rate of ethylene production. And you find out that each cell, each one of my preloaded fat PHB xanthobacteria, are turning over nitrogen at 3.1 times 10 to the ninth per cell units of nitrogen. So that's super fast. It's because they're super energized on PHB. 
Most bugs, if they can do fertilization, they spend most of their time looking for food to fertilize the plant. My bugs don't have to do that. And they go into the root of the plant and they live in the roots and they suck in nitrogen and it says, I have an unlimited, you're gonna hear next talk, nuclear power supply of energy, but it's a renewable one in PHB. So look what happens. I can put the bugs in the ground and I can grow crops. And so the ones in the back have my bugs in the ground, the ones in the front is just out of a fertile soil. So this is a living biofertilizer. The bugs are in the ground sucking nitrogen in from the air and it's fertilizing plants. And I get big radishes. <laughs> I'm getting 300% increases in crop growth. It's a little better than I'm telling you. Those radishes that came out at 300% came out of the basically sandy soil. We inoculated the soil because I'm actually rejuvenating the soil with carbon and nitrogen from the air. The radishes on the left with no fertilizer are in the gray dots, not the red dots on the far left. That's just fertile land. If I took those radishes on the left and tried to grow them out of that red soil, you would see no radish growth. So I'm able to grow out of infertile land, because think about it, I'm putting nitrogen and carbon into the, the butt, into the ground. I didn't show you, they also, I can get phosphorus because if I put them by wastewater, they extract phosphorus from wastewater and they make polyphosphate. That was the black thing. So using sunlight, I'm putting carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus back into the ground. That's why I can grow crops. Here's lettuce, not just radishes, I'm going for the full salad. Um, that one on the left, lower left, is calcium nitrate, and for the same cost equivalent, which is what you use for chemical fertilizer, that's 4x on the right, so I'm doing better than regular fertilizer for, on basis of nitrogen content. That's why this one is ready to go, commercialization. I'm done in a minute. The nice thing is after it eats the fur, remember the PHB, I told you it leaves the carbon behind. So you, doing this, because my biomass is growing 10 times faster, or I'm fixing CO2 10 times faster than the plant, I can sequester carbon and grow crops. So if you took sort of the US agricultural one, one crop cycle and use my fertilizer versus chemical fertilizer, you would put one gigaton of carbon back into the ground. That was on the last slide, the shell slide, there was a negative bar for agriculture. This is, you can modify your yellow bar and wonder what would 10 times that look like. You can, you can store a lot of carbon through agriculture. So using just air, sunlight, and water, we can make fuels, that's carbon neutral, right? You make a fuel, you burn it, CO2 goes back. So I'm not digging it out of the ground. So that's carbon neutral. The fertilization's actually carbon negative. You can grow crops. All right, just to end, it just went to zero. Since I'm a plenary speaker, I want to leave one happy message for you. I figure I should do that since I'm a plenary speaker. So just before he died, I would do a lot of things with uh, this fellow, Kurt Vonnegut. And he would hear me say, the planet, the planet, help the planet, save the planet. And he said, Dan, and this is verbatim almost. He said, the planet's a living organism. And she has an immunological response system like all living organisms. And in an immunological response system, when the organism gets compromised, it kicks in. And when the intruder sufficiently compromises it, it kills it. So he said, don't worry about the planet because she's wonderful with a beautiful system. So as we carelessly choose a path to suffocate the planet in CO2, we need not worry. The planet's immunological system will respond and eliminate all humans, and she's going to be just fine. So when you guys don't want a carbon price and everyone, I go to bed at night, that's what I think about, and it just makes me smile and feel really happy. So with that, I'd like to thank your attention. I'll take any questions. Yeah, that's such a sad story. 
Um, when we did that with sun catalytics, we could make hydrogen at one kilogram of hydrogen at $4.45. So why is that important? One kilogram of hydrogen has the energy content of one gallon of gasoline. And that was in 2009. And you guys don't remember this, but gasoline prices were $5, and everybody was, like, super happy. And then there's this thing that started happening called fracking, and we aren't pricing carbon. So right now, I think the hydrogen price I looked last week is buck forty-two. Is that about right? It's in that ballpark. So you get hydrogen for forty-two. And then there's another problem with hydrogen, right? You don't, this is this infrastructure problem. You don't have an infrastructure. So after I generate hydrogen, what are you going to do with it? You're going to have to get a bunch of investors to put fuel cells everywhere, never mind the distribution and transport. So that's why we decided to use bugs to make fuel. But we can make hydrogen at $4.45 because the chi price of chi Chinese silicon has been dropping. It's probably even cheaper now. But it will never be cheaper than poking holes in the ground, I can assure you. I'll repeat the question. She said, thank you, Professor. Your presentation sucked. Go ahead. But, uh, but still, I was so surprised, and and, and when, when when I heard that the uh, fertilizer could be uh, carbon uh, dioxide negative, it's so good. But as a policy guy, uh, I'm wondering how much it cost because uh, even you know. Yeah, I didn't put any. I, I agree with. Yeah, that I we didn't. Need to put a yeah, price the cost it, of yeah. nitrogen fertilizer. So I'll just tell you, we're way cheaper than organic fertilizers. In the U.S., we're a factor of two more expensive than regular chemical fertilizer in the U.S. But you have to realize, my nitrogen, I don't know what the real cost is, because when you use urea, you put ammonium, and that goes to a salt, and it washes away. My fertilizer doesn't wash away. The bugs live in the root. So I'm saying I'm two to two and a half more ex times expensive than chemical fertilizer in the U.S., but I haven't factored in no runoff versus runoff. We still have to do that. And then in China, I'm way cheaper because China has to ship their methane in on tankers to make Harbor Bosch. And here, I don't have to do methane shipping. And so you can imagine China is very interested in this right now. Okay, very glad to know that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, the bugs, the, the question was when the land goes foul, do the bugs live? The bugs can only live, that's why I'm calling it a fertilizer. The bugs can only live as long as they have PHB. When they run out of polyhydroxybutyrate, dead which you probably want. You want to put a kill switch when you release things in nature. But we can fatten the bugs up pretty fat on PHB. So we've done now, we think we can get to 80% by volume PHB. We've already done in lettuce four plant cycles. And so it's possible we could do an annual crop cycle with one fertilization. But it, we haven't done enough work yet to see how much PHB and longevity, longevity of bug. But once the PHB has gone dead, and you've got to apply more, so it's a real fertilizer. Are you going to commercialization? Am I going to commercialization? Um, the, 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 I'm going to commercialization on the fuels, but I'm not commercializing it. One of the deals I cut when I left MIT and moved to Harvard is I can control my own IP, not the university. So I've given all my IP to the Institute of Chemical Technology in India, and ICT is commercializing it, and they can make whatever money they want off it. I want them to do it in India, and then if that works, I'm in negotiations with certain countries in Africa. So somebody else will make money. For the fertilizer, there's a company called Kula Bio that's just starting because uh, of the interest in this, and so we'll see where that goes. Thank you, Dan. Okay.